Good morning. And, uh, so now uh, we start uh, the seventh uh, teaching. Again, the precious Lama taught the following. Okay, so, precious, precious Lama, Gyobajit and Sunga. The unmistaken great road, the one and only path followed by all Tathagatas of the three times, Buddhas of past, present, and future, consists of two. So, this, this uh, unmistaken great road this path, this process uh, that all beings took uh, to become awakened, to become Buddhas, uh, there are two parts to it or two elements to it. Skill in methods and profound insight. Mm. So these are uh, uh, the two, uh, what, another way of uh, summarizing and talking about what is it that we practice, you know, what is it that we have to do. Uh, elsewhere, you see Kyopa talking about it in terms of the two bodhicittas. In a way, then you can also match this and say skill in methods is related to relative bodhicitta and profound insight is related to absolute bodhicitta. So sometimes these are also called the two accumulations, the accumulation of merit, which again now you can uh, connect with skill and methods, and the accumulation of wisdom, which you can now uh, relate to here as the uh, element of profound insight. Now, what are skillful methods? What, are, what is this called upaya? Uh, in Sanskrit, uh, called upaya. And what is profound insight? As for skillful methods, they are to be governed by, meaning they are, if they are skillful methods, then they are motivated by, and they are powered by relative bodhicitta. And in that way, gather the accumulation of merit. So now those links are made explicitly. What is to be understood by skillful methods? They are the extraordinary methods for attaining Buddhahood. Without these methods, it isn't possible to awaken the unsurpassable Buddhahood, even with profound insight. So even if you have profound insight, now of course here, uh, Kyopa is not saying, you know, like the profound insight uh, at the stage of uh, like uh, bodhisattvas on the Bhumis and all of that. Yeah, he's saying that... Uh, even if you think, right, you have great understanding. And, and this great understanding, <laughs> like me, some understanding, not great, but then seem to be able to talk about it, and other people seem to like it, and be inspired, and this and that. But if we do not use skillful methods, Skillful methods to do what? To integrate this profound insight into our lives, then it will not do. So he says, you know, without these methods of skillful, these skillful methods, it's not possible to achieve Buddhahood. As for gathering the accumulation of merit, it has three aspects. So now Kyoba says, now let's look at when we say gathering merit. So he says when we look at the, the, the subject of gathering merit, there are three things to pay attention to. The field. So here you could say it's the object. Where do you... Uh, where do you plant these seeds of merit so that they can sprout. That's the field. Then the intention and object. Okay, so never mind. Don't use. 
from the first word, the, don't use the field as object. It will cause confusion. So three three words here: field, intention, and object. There have been countless teachings on the field, as in who we perform these actions of merit towards. So here he says, you know, there are many, many teachings on the field. But if we were to summarize them, you can think of them as having two. One is the field of beings, and the other one is the field of the noble ones. So actions that are meritorious, done towards ordinary beings, and done towards the noble ones. So there, here, there are four kinds of noble ones with regards to this field. Those who have actualized the truth of the path that leads to nirvana and have risen above samsara, the great ocean of suffering. So he says, this is the definition of those noble ones. And with regards to that, there are four types of noble ones. What this means in detail is taught in the extensive, medium, and condensed scriptures of the perfection of wisdom, but particularly in the perfection of wisdom in 25,000 verses in the Panya Paramita Sutra, known as the Panya Paramita in 25,000 verses. The longest one is called Pragya Paramita in 100,000 verses. And then there is the 10,000, then there's the 8,000, and so on and so forth. Among the four kinds of noble ones, so now Kyoba will give, will list out the four. Among the four types of noble ones, a hearer is free from desire for the three realms and has actualized all stages of their path and attain to the state of an arhat. The second kind of noble ones are the solitary realizers, and they have actualized the awakening of a solitary realizer. The third kind are the noble, are the bodhisattvas, but not just any bodhisattvas, but bodhisattvas who abide, who have arrived at at least the first bhumi, and all the way up to the tenth bhumi, the tenth ground. Uh, and he says here to further give more information, he says this is when uh, bodhisattvas have arrived at the path of seeing. And the path of seeing is arrived at uh, the equivalent of the first bhumi, uh, the first ground. Before that, there are also bodhisattvas, but they are not called noble beings. They are not called aryas. So like if we have taken the bodhisattva vow, and we mean it, you know, and we are working on it, then we are also bodhisattvas, but we are not aryas. The fourth kind of noble one uh, are the Tathagatas, the Buddhas. And so these are the four types of noble ones. Detailed explanation of why the four kinds of noble ones are pure fields of merit is given in the Sutra on applying the seal and other places. Then when it comes to the so this first, you know, this first first group, right? The four types of noble ones, perhaps no surprise, you know, right? when we perform acts of merit uh, in relation to them. Uh, principally, like we serve them, we pay homage to them, we make offerings to them, we uh, do their work, we assist them, and so on and so forth. Uh, we listen to them, we pay attention to them, we take care of them, all of this, you know. And this is a supreme uh, field. This is a very um, uh, special field field. The other field, called the field of beings, there, he says, 
And this means all beings. Who are as limitless as space. Now, here he says, first, we should understand them as a pure field. Because Buddha nature abides in them. That Buddha nature abides in them is taught in uh, the Uttara Tantra, uh, and the quote from there, the highest continuum, due to the pervasion of Buddha's Dharmakaya, due to the indivisibility of suchness, and due to their potential, beings are always endowed uh, with Buddha nature. Now here to say that they are a pure field uh, is in contrast to what most uh, other explanations uh, will say. Most other explanations uh, will say uh, the field of the four types of noble ones, that's a pure field. That's accumulating merit uh, from uh, planting in a pure field. Then they will say that sentient beings, on the other hand, are the field of merit, uh, but they are an impure field. Uh, in other places, uh, you'll find other lamas uh, explaining it this way, uh, that sentient beings are uh, the impure field of merit and the noble ones are the pure field of merit. Here, Kyopa Rinpoche specifically wants to say, no, they are both uh, considered, uh, they are both to be understood as pure fields. And of course, uh, there's no need for him to explain uh, how the field of the noble ones are pure field, uh, he has to explain why uh, the field of sentient beings are also pure field. Uh, because they are endowed with Buddha nature, that's the first reason. Second, beings are a pure field because there is not one of them uh, who hasn't previously been our parent. Uh, so we have to recognize that therefore recognize that they are a pure field. Third, they are a pure field because we ourselves are bodhisattvas who have aroused bodhicitta and thus care for beings. Meaning, we care for them, you know, as if they are our children. So they are pure in that way. In other words, you know, what, what Gilbert Rinpoche is doing here is not to... Uh, kind of strengthened, you know, perhaps our uh, habit uh, of discriminating. Mm -hmm. This I like, this I don't like. Uh, by using the vocabulary of, oh, Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, Arahats, Prateka, Buddhas, oh, pure, so pure. And then, you know, when we make offerings to them, we are like, oh, like this, like this, and like this. Uh, if we do that, you know, I don't know with you guys. Uh, but in Asian, you know, like, oh. And then when they're uh, uh, planting seeds in the impure field, you know, it can be very kind of um, hierarchical. Uh, like, uh, there, go, you know, just take. <laughs> in, in Asian context, it can be like this, you know. Uh, here, I think in the West, is probably all of it is just like this. Eh, here, think. <laughs> no sense of the pure field, you know. No sense of like, you know, uh, yeah, you know, something to venerate. I don't know, I don't know in Mexico, but uh, in the U.S., probably, you know, the whole culture of casualness. Yeah, eh, here, there. It's good if it bridges the gap of the, uh, you know, kind of this hierarchical uh, attitude. But it's definitely not good uh, if we, you know, this side we're like, oh, and over here, right? <laughs> we should elevate this side to this side, you know, that we are uh, kind, considerate, respectful. Uh, because this is all part of disciplined conduct. Mm. 
So basically, you know, to consider both these fields, uh, the noble ones and ordinary beings as pure fields, also means then, you know, the acts of merit that we create, we perform towards them uh, are done with, with heart, you know, uh, with care. So full-hearted, you know. Uh, so it says here, toward that field of beings, uh, this is still the second field, giving is practiced to gather the accumulation of merit. It is taught that to act for the welfare of beings through the four means of attraction, a bodhisattva must begin by gathering beings through the generosity in material beings. And so forth. Four types of, of, of uh, means of attraction is uh, through generosity in giving uh, material things specifically. Then generosity of pleasing speech, the generosity uh, of uh, teaching meaningful conduct and living according uh, to what one teaches. And so this is particularly saying, you know, especially uh, those who are kind of have the role of teachers, you have to be willing to give, uh, to use these four means of attraction. Uh, one is you are generous with your resources and then you use pleasing speech and you teach meaningful conduct. You teach meaningful conduct. Even more important than theory. And then you show through your own example. So these are the four means of attraction. So it applies to all of us, even if you are not formally a teacher, this and that. In order to attract beings uh, so that they can come in contact uh, with the liberating teachings of the Buddha, uh, we should cultivate these four means of attraction. Uh, it is also taught that beings who are gathered through that generosity uh, become ripened and liberated. Moreover, it is taught in the perfection of wisdom in 80,000 verses, The generosity of a bodhisattva puts an end to a destiny as hungry ghost. It puts an end to poverty and likewise to all afflictions. When its fruit is experienced, there are boundless pleasures. Generosity ripens sentient beings, suffering beings. So when we are generous with our resources, when we're general with our attention, with our time, this can really uh, attract beings uh, and relieve their suffering. Thus, there is a pair of pure fields, the noble ones and uh, the ordinary beings. Now, concerning the second point, uh, after the field, then the discussion on intention. Concerning the point of the pure intention in giving, for example, uh, this intention uh, realizes the primordially unborn emptiness of, of what? Of both fields, whether it's the noble ones or the ordinary beings, they also realize the primordial birthless emptiness of what is given, what you give, and the giver. So this is sometimes called the purity of the three spheres. In all actions, right, there are these three parts. The doer, which is the third one. The object that is involved in doing something. And finally, the recipient of what you are doing. The, the other side of uh, that 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 action, uh, so including you know if, <laughs> in a negative one if you if you yell at someone you know the one who yells. In this case, then those words that you use to yell is the second type. Uh, 
and then the recipient of your yelling. These are the three spheres. So here is talking about you know the giver, what is given, and to whom is given. All these three, they need to be recognized as primordially birthless. Such an intention is superior to mere relative bodhicitta. In fact, this intention is not relative bodhicitta. It is ultimate bodhicitta. The translation here maybe need to fix slightly. In fact, this intention is not relative bodhicitta, but it is ultimate bodhicitta. It is superior to the path of the perfections, the vehicle of characteristics. Since the fields consist entirely of male and female deities, and the nature of the object is wisdom, nectar, this state of mind is superior. Mm, I don't have the Tibetan with me, and also even if I have, I can't look at it so quickly, so easily. But my sense here is that this last two sentence right it's saying it's 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 adding to what has been said before first of all <clears throat> if mm, we can maintain or we have the understanding and realization of the emptiness of the three spheres or the purity of the three spheres right meaning uh, using the example of giving the one giving the one, uh, that which is being given, whether it's something or words or time, right? And who is being given to? These three have to be recognized as empty uh, of inherent existence, meaning they are dependently arisen. There's no giver, strictly speaking, if there is no receiver. Likewise, if what is given does not exist, then to talk about giver and receiver is absurd. Likewise, to conceptualize a receiver, if a gift is not there, if, 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 if the thing is, there is nothing there to give, also is absurd. So that, he, he says, is the superior intention. Right? Because now we're discussing intention. Yeah. So in terms of that, he says, this intention is even higher than relative bodhicitta intention. Relative bodhicitta is, is what? Is based on great loving kindness and compassion motivating us to do something beneficial and altruistic and beneficial and altruistic in the way of wanting to help this person achieve Buddhahood. That's relative intention or, or the intention of relative bodhicitta. Here it said that if you have the intention of ultimate bodhicitta, then it's even superior to the intention of uh, that is of the the relative bodhicitta. Then here, these last two sentences, I think the meaning should be something like, and then when we look at this, uh, this, this supreme intention, if you look at it, if your understanding is on the side of the uh, vehicle of characteristics or the vehicle of perfections, remember, right, there are two divisions. The secret mantra, and there is the vehicle of secret mantra and the vehicle of characteristics or the vehicle of perfections. So I here I feel what he's saying is, with regards to this supreme intention, if you only have the vehicle of characteristics, then it's the three spheres are empty, three spheres are pure. 
superior to that is the secret mantra where, whereby uh, the last sentence the field are understood as Buddhas male and female deities male and female what is given its nature is elixir wisdom elixir and then of course he doesn't say here but yourself is also Buddha then this is superior intention superior to the intention that is only has the three spheres are empty the three spheres are pure Do you understand what's going on? No? <laughs> so let's pause and discuss. Mm -hmm. Judy? Are you saying that basically you need to understand a lot of the Can you hear? Uh, let's see. Well. Yeah. It's a little crackly, but try. Let's see. Uh, um, so, so Ben? Is saying you need to have the 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 we can barely make out what you're saying. Let's. Um, this issue has turned up. I want to see if it is your end or somewhat or universal. Can somebody else speak and let's see if we're still getting this chop, chop, choppy, chop, chop. Nathan, take a stab at this. Um, okay. Okay. Um. Uh, the impression that I got, Judy, that, it's on your end. The choppity chop chop. Yeah. Okay, Nathan, go go ahead. Yeah. Um, when you asked that, uh, the impression that I got is that giving here is to counteract our uh, confused ways of knowing. So that he says that it's better to think in this way is because it's one step farther in counteracting our... What, what is this way? <laughs> he says that uh, Oh, well, I lost the... <laughs> exactly, but where he was saying that to to view the receiver as the male and female Buddhas, to view the gift as wisdom, elixir, to view yourself as Buddha when you give. Mm -hmm. My impression is that he's saying that that's better than... That's the highest intention. The highest, yes. That's the highest. So intention, again, that word is a little, uh, to translate into English as intention. I mean, literally it's intention, but but we don't use English in that way. Uh, so that's my kind of like, I've mm. said a few times the word intention here is a little, we don't use, in English, we don't use intention in that way. More like um, understanding. Hmm? Mm. Understanding plus what motivates you. Uh, so yes, so he's laying out, huh? he's laying out in this section with regards to the issue of uh, motivation, uh, with regards to the 
the the the I mean, we have to step one way back, right? He says, uh, uh, when it comes to, um, you, you go one step back, he says, um, when it comes to uh, the point, uh, um, when it comes to uh, um, teachings about, right? There is the field, uh, if you, follow if you track this he yeah, says there is the field there is the intention and slash understanding right and yeah, there is also object right this is on page 83 so he is finished talking about the fields yeah, the two fields now he's talking about intention, right? So with regards to intention, yeah, he says, with regards to this issue of intention, uh, then, now starting on 85, yeah, uh, The intention, the understanding that comes from the place of relative bodhicitta, it needs to be at least that. Even better than that is the intention slash hyphen understanding that is from the position of absolute bodhicitta. And with regards to that, what is it? From the position of absolute bodhicitta, then it's what's known as the threefold birthless nature. Are we still together? Is that the, depend the dependent origination of doer, Object and recipient. Yeah, this is same. Same as thing. Threefold emptiness, which he just discussed. Yeah, here. So without that, without introducing more vocabulary to this, right? So uh, uh, it's called yeah. this intention understanding. Uh, this intention, maybe translate this way on page 85, this intention uh, comes with, uh, is with the realization of the primordially unborn emptiness of the three spheres. The field, the object that is given, and oneself the giver. From the bottom of 85 to the top of 86. Yeah, then you you can say, oh, that is the interdependence of the three, la la la. No end to, right? <laughs> so, so if you have just seeing the emptiness of the field or the emptiness of beings is not enough you need to see no the, that's not even no no yes that is true but this is not but it's you you have to see the emptiness not just of all of that but the 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 action as well that's not that's, it's true what you say is correct but this is not his point here his point is this is from the perspective of ultimate bodhicitta. And from the perspective of ultimate bodhicitta, the threefold emptiness has to be there. And this is superior to giving from the perspective of relative bodhicitta. Okay. Yeah, and what is relative bodhicitta? Out of immeasurable love and compassion, wanting to free beings and establish them in a state of Buddha. So emptiness is the, the difference. 
Is that what this is saying? That's the superior, to add that to it. To add that to it, but we're not done. He, there's a third edition. Right, but so far, that's what he's saying? Yes. Okay. Omar. Yes, I think what he's trying to explain here is that there is um, a pair of pure fields. One of yes. them is the, the noble ones, and the other one is the beings. We start, we begin with the beings, right? And then here is trying to explain why the the, uh, the noble ones is superior or why no, the, no, no, no. the part of the perfection is superior to the characteristics. No, 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 no. No, it's not. No, 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 this no. Because nothing to do with field here. Nothing to do with field here. Now it's about uh, your understanding uh, when you are uh, giving to the field. Uh, doesn't matter what the fields. Mm -mm. No, it's because because of the intention and the intention. No, uh, but it's also not about the field. Nothing to do with field. Okay, field is done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's not. He's not saying this field is superior to this field. He's now talking about this intention is superior. This intention hyphen understanding is superior to this intention hyphen understanding. But even more amazing than the two that we have already looked at is the third one, which is. You are Buddha. What you're offering is elixir. Who is receiving a Buddha's? That's the highest intention hyphen understanding. It's a translation issue, or maybe I, I cannot say that because like I said I don't have the Tibetan right in front of me. The last two sentences there is a little confusing. It is superior to the path of the perfections. Like what is superior? You know, it. Hmm? It is superior to the path of the perfections, the vehicle of characteristics. Like it is not saying the vehicle of characteristics is superior. Firstly, it is not saying the vehicle of characteristics is superior to the path of the perfections because those two are synonyms. Yeah, perfections and characteristics, they are synonyms. So then if you just look at this translation, you say it, what is it? It then sounds like it's saying the realization of the emptiness of the three spheres. That that is superior uh, to the path of perfections, the vehicle of characteristics. No. Uh, because in the path of perfections, and uh, uh, in the path of perfections, also known as the vehicle of characteristics, yeah, the threefold emptiness is already there, taught very clearly. So Shantideva's Bodhicaya Avatara is basically taught from the perspective of the vehicle of perfections, or the vehicle of characteristics. There, the three-sphere emptiness is already there. So this it here, it is superior to the path of perfection. No, 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 this is not talking about what was just discussed. This is talking about what is coming in the next sentence, which is the kind of giving that sees the recipients as male and female deities. The nature of that object is the elixir. And here it doesn't say, you, the giver, is Buddha. That is superior to the mere three sphere is empty.
So it's how you see the field that he's talking it's about. Not just a field. <laughs> but, well, he's... The he's, object that is given? It's how you see this activity of giving in this case. Well, it's always like that, yes. Well, how is that different from what we've already been taught? Just, I mean, that you see it as... What do you the, mean, how is that different? Well, I mean, this is not saying, I mean... This is saying very much like what we've already heard. <laughs> I mean, you see the field as 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 Buddha. You see the what you're giving as nectar, which is the highest, mm -hmm. and you see yourself as Buddha. Mm -hmm. What is new, Judy, in any of this? I think I said to you the last time. <laughs> I think you did. <laughs> Are you expecting something to pop out of the hat that you've never seen before? I guess I am. <laughs> <laughs> but, but how often are we clear about this? Really? Yeah, I, I, so I dare say here, I'm a little bit clearer than you. So all of you have to catch up. <laughs> then Cuba will stop talking. <laughs> Each time, you know? The fact remains, each time we're still like, oh, wait, what? <laughs> Maybe part of it is like we're trying to find something that is even more than what we already know, you know? So now it's to clarify what we already know. There's nothing new. Clarify and make it, have it be clear always. So that if you get woken up rudely in the middle of the night, you know, what is the superior uh, intention and understanding and giving, uh, you can say, you know, all givers are Buddhas. All that is given is elixir. Uh, all that is given to are Buddhas too. And they are empty. They, they, are, they have the threefold emptiness to them. And this is all based on love and compassion for beings. So there you have it. Relative bodhicitta, absolute bodhicitta. And relative and absolute all wrapped together by secret mantra understanding. <laughs> okay, today is good. <laughs> we will continue <laughs> tomorrow yeah. and uh, just in case just in case you're coming back tomorrow hoping for something you've never heard before you'll be disappointed <laughs> which is to say you know very good you all have heard this many times you know that's why you're no longer surprised you're like oh you mean that? Very good. Because many, many, many other people have not even heard of this before. They're not even at that level of like, what? Just this? <laughs> the majority of people will still be, wait, what do you mean? Okay. So it's already very good that your response now is, you know, what? Just that? Correct. Just that. <laughs> Chang Chu Sam Chu Rim Puchi Magi Banam Gyuji Gyebanyam Bame Paya Gone Gong Du Bell Show
Okay, Tata. Bye bye. See you tomorrow. Thank you.